Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 888 Holdings PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted any time using the Q&A tab just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during today's meeting. However, the company can review all questions and will publish any responses where it's appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet company platform. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll. And if you would give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Chairman Lord Mendelson. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us today. I'm John Mendelson, and alongside me are Yarrow Duffner, Group Chief Financial Officer, and Vaughan Lewis. Chief Strategy Officer. So as we move on to the presentation, on slide two, you can see the agenda for today's presentation. I'll be providing an overview of key developments during the first half before handing over to Yaro van Vaughan to take you through our financial and strategic progress in more detail. We will then take your questions. Now, slide three reaffirms our key priorities as a board against which we have made good progress in all key areas in the four months since our full year results and Q1 update. Firstly, I was delighted to announce the appointment of Per Widerstrom as Chief Executive Officer a few weeks ago. Per was the clear standout candidate for the board after an extensive process with a wide range of high quality individuals. He is an inspiring and proven leader with extensive industry experience, including in public companies, and a very strong track record of executing value creation plans in omnichannel global betting and gaming businesses. Now, across the business, we continue to reinforce and strengthen our teams with excellent external hires and internal promotions. Overall, I am extremely confident that we are building a world-class team to deliver our value creation plan. Our second priority is ESG and sustainability. As a board, we remain resolutely focused on sustainability and compliance, which is fundamental to the business we are building. The actions that we have taken to enhance our compliance framework have had and continue to have an impact on our revenues. But we are confident that these are the right actions for the business to create long-term sustainable value. All of these actions are changing the shape of the business, leading to a much higher quality and much more sustainable platform for future growth. In Q2, 95% of our group revenues came from customers in locally regulated or taxed countries. The board's third priority is execution, which I'll address in more detail on the next slide. So on slide four, this is how we are executing the strategic plan that we outlined at our Capital Markets Day last November. You can see on the charts that 888 is a business that was historically relatively subscale and overweight in its offshore market mix. Through a significant acceleration in growth, we embarked on an ambitious M&A plan to transform our scale. And I'm pleased to say we are making good progress towards our 2025 target for at least 2 billion in revenue. While this is a complex global business with multiple technology, regulatory <clears throat> and competitive dynamics at its heart, there are three key drivers, revenue, marketing, and our operating expenses. Starting with revenue, we have been taking quite radical actions to change the mix of our revenues to provide a higher quality more profitable and more sustainable revenue mix that provides us with a strong platform for growth. Secondly, marketing spend. As two separate businesses, William Hill and 888 had different marketing plans and strategies. In markets like the UK, with the strength of the combined business and with two leading brands, we have changed the marketing strategy to focus on driving sustainable, profitable returns as a portfolio of brands across the market. And thirdly, operating costs. Our principle here is to achieve the scale benefits in our combined businesses by removing duplication and delivering best in class and scalable shared functions to support our global ambitions. 
This reflects our overall plan to create a customer-focused organization with high growth potential. We have seen the foundations of this take shape in the first half with higher customer volumes, lower average spending levels, lower marketing ratio, and higher profits. This is our platform for the future for sustainable value creation. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Yariv to walk us through the financial results in more detail. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Starting with slide five, we show the main item in the bridge between 2022 actual to performer result and then to our 2023 actual result. On the left, you can see the revenue bridge between uh, the revenue bridge starting from reported revenue in H1 2022 of 332 million, including William Hill, William Hill result and excluding the bingo business, the performer revenue would have been 943 million. Retail revenue are 16 million higher, reflecting the positive trend across the high street and the benefit of the CapEx spend in the last two years. UK online revenue are 35 million lower, reflecting both the impact of the shift toward lower spending customer and the short-term top-line hit from the removal of unprofitable marketing spend. International revenue are 43 million lower, reflecting mainly the impact of regulatory and compliance changes, including the suspension of VAP in the Middle East, but also the refined focus on our core and growth markets. In the core markets, Italy and Spain, we saw strong year-on-year -year growth. On the right-hand side, you can see the same bridge for adjusted EBITDA. The important point to make here is that while you see the revenue declines, EBITDA is up mainly in the UK online, where margins are significantly higher, leading to a 11 million increase in EBITDA. On slide six, we present the revenue and adjusted EBITDA by segment on a performer basis. We operate the business in two main segments, the UK, which includes our UK and Ireland online businesses and our retail business, and international, which include all our businesses outside of the UK, including the US. For the UK, performer revenue were down 3% in H123, reflecting strong trend in retail, more than offset by the structural changes we have been making to our online business. For our international business, revenue were down 14%. The main dr driver of this was the closure of our Middle East VIP in January, which explain a little, a little over half of the drop and further changes to our dot-com compliance framework, which negatively impact, impacted our revenue. Excluding these regulatory and compliance changes, international revenue are broadly stable. We have effectively right-sized the business and improved sustainability significantly with only 5% of group revenue now coming from non-locally regulated or tax markets. This new position set a strong base for future growth with an increased focus on our core and growth markets. Moving to slide seven, we have made good progress on our three core financial priorities that we laid out at our investor day. Our first focus is execution of synergies. We deliver additional 66 million of cash synergies in H123, mainly across operation and marketing, and we now expect to reach the 150 million target by 2024. We continue to optimize the business and seek out efficiency that can benefit the customer experience and plan to reinvest any additional saving opportunity in accelerating growth. Our second priority is improving our adjusted EBITDA margin. As we have been executing on our integration plans and delivering improved ROI on our marketing spend, we have confidence in our plan to deliver an adjusted EBITDA margin of 20% in the full year 2023. And our third priority is deleveraging. We managed to reduce our leverage multiple from 5.6x in December 2022 to 5.1x at the end of June. I expect to end the year at slightly below 5x and we continue to target below 3.5x in 2025. 
Moving to slide eight, I would like to provide an update on our outlook for 2023. We see no change to our expectation of low to mid single digit revenue decline for the full year. Following a 7% drop in H1-23, the decline is more likely to be at the mid single digit of the range reflecting the slower than expected pace of recovery in the Middle East. We also remain on track to deliver an adjusted EBITDA margin of 20% this year. We delivered a margin of a little under 18% in the first half, and with the phasing of marketing investment and synergies, we have good visibility on this reaching 20% for the full year. Overall, this has been good first half, reflecting our strong financial discipline and delivering on our target to increase profitability and drive cash generation. I'm pleased with the progress we have made, particularly with reducing the leverage and with good visibility of slightly less than 5x at the end of this year, as we continue to progress toward our target of 3.5x or below in 2025. I will now hand over to Vaughn to run through the strategic highlights. Thanks, Yarif, and good afternoon, everyone. So as John and Yarif have both touched on, we've made excellent progress against our priorities during this period. 2023 is a key year in our position and plan potential roadmap, and we've taken rapid and assertive actions to change the mix of the business to drive sustainable value creation. And that will allow us to evolve from a focus on integration to a clear focus on driving growth. On slide nine, we can see a few examples of the proactive actions in practice in our biggest market, the UK. So the summary of the first half of the online business in the UK is higher volumes, higher player volumes, and higher market share of players. Lower ARPU as the business is remixed towards the most sustainable, lower spending player groups, and higher profitability as we focus our marketing investment on building sustainable returns. On the left-hand side, you can see continued growth in our active player base. This growth is coming from lower spending, recreational cohorts, as we continue to grow market share of players. While we are growing share of players, our market share of revenue is lower. This reflects the dynamic in the middle of the charts, with significantly lower average revenue per user as our business mix shift towards the lowest spending recreational players. You can see our average monthly revenue now across over a million players a month is 44 pounds. So just about a tenner a week. This huge and growing recreational customer base gives us real confidence about our plans to grow market share in the coming years. And what's even better, we're driving this growth even more efficiently. And you can see on the right, we're seeing much more efficient marketing from being able to target our brands more effectively. So this is a year of transition in the UK that really sets our platform for future growth. Turning to slide 10 and a few words about our international markets. Our core international markets, which are Italy and Spain, saw double digit growth in the period. Our growth markets were up double digits, excluding Germany, where we've seen significant regulatory change. And overall revenues are lower in the period, though, and this reflects the significant reduction in dot-com revenues that Eureve already covered. We've been delighted with the progress in our pipeline markets, with our Africa joint venture going from strength to strength. We launched in September, and at the end of our 10th full month, we've already passed 1 million customers and are seeing continued strong revenue growth with a 25% month-on-month growth rate so far this year. The success here gives us real confidence about the value creation, and we recently completed the acquisition of Betline here, further supporting our expansion plans in Africa with some excellent front-end technology and adding further licensed jurisdictions. We're looking forward to accelerating growth here with future market launches over the rest of this year and into 2024. So overall, this has been a period of strong strategic progress with our products, brands, and customer focus, building a strong platform for future growth. I'd now like to hand back to John to conclude. Thank you, Vaughan. Turning to slide 11 to conclude with a summary of the huge progress we have made in the first half, as we look to unlock the huge potential of this business. We have made tremendous progress with integration, delivering 66 million of synergies in the first half of this year, 
and accelerating our plan such that we will have achieved our target run rate of 150 million pounds within 2024, a year earlier than planned. We have delivered on our goal of improved profitability with adjusted EBITDA up 9% and margin improving by around 2.6 percentage points. And on leverage in just six months, we've already reduced this by 0.5 turns. The speed of deleveraging in the first half was partly helped by some favorable foreign exchange movements, reducing our net debt. But we remain committed to bringing the leverage down continually and effectively through to our 2025 target of less than three and a half times. And we have positively changed the mix of our business, reducing risks and providing a higher quality, more sustainable platform for future growth. With the appointment of Pear, I will be handing over to a world-class CEO and look forward to updating you soon with a CFO appointment as we continue to strengthen our team and execute our plan to deliver enhanced shareholder value. And with that, I'd like to hand back to the moderator for questions. That's great. John, Vaughan, Yarif, thank you very much indeed for updating investors. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review the questions submitted already, I'd just like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with the copy of the slides and the published Q&A, will be available via your InvestorMeet company dashboard. Um, thank you, firstly, to everybody for your engagement this afternoon. Um, um, John, Yarif and uh, Vaughan, we have received a number of questions. So if I may uh, start with the first one, which was pre-submitted ahead of today's event, which reads as follows. Is the economic priority to reduce the leverage of this business? If so, what is your guidance as to the timelines? And what is the longer term right leverage as a ratio to EBITDA? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, so it's indeed uh, a priority to deleverage um, we managed to reduce in the first half from 5.6 at the end of 2022 to 5.1 at the end of June. Uh, we expect this to go below five at the, at the year end and uh, at, uh, to be 3.5 or below at the end of uh, 2025. Uh, we set that target for 2025 because that's what, uh, what we believe is the, is the right level for us. Um, just as a reminder, the board also uh, agree that uh, the, the dividend will be resumed only when uh, leverage will go to the level of 3x. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's turn to the next question submitted during your presentation. You reference future growth projects in today's announcement. Could you expand on what these look like and, and if so, how they may be funded? Yeah, so there's a combination of uh, projects that we're talking about here. So if you take our, what we call our growth markets, that, that's a small number of, of focus markets where, where collectively we look to operate these at, at break even. Um, and the way we do that is, is by reinvesting the underlying profitability into, into uh, more marketing, more customer growth and, and, and fueling the, the future uh, market share gains in, in those key territories. Uh, we're always looking for new markets to join that that growth group uh, what we look for in there is is the right combination of market conditions uh, in terms of regulation tax uh, payments and so on and the competitive dynamics and then our competitive uh, assets so how strong are our brands how good is our product set how good is our payments and, and localization operations and so on uh, so we're constantly looking to build new growth markets and that and that can be either organically uh, where we get the benefits of our tech migrations and the, and the breadth of product and payments expertise that we have in, in, in the core business or that can be uh, through what we call our pipeline investments so these are these are typically low uh, capital investment into into new territories uh, a good example of that would be our, our, our African joint venture. Um, so those are the types of investments we're talking about. They're, they're either funded or, uh, as they are already uh, through the PL. So we're, we're already sort of seeding those investments, uh, or they're relatively low uh, capital requirements, like our, like our joint venture in Africa. That's great. Thank you. Um, turning to the next question, given the William Hill acquisition, what's the appetite for further M&A? And do you want to land and expand in any new territories? Uh, that's a, that's a good follow up to the the previous one. I think um, you know we've we've laid out a plan where in our core and growth markets we're we're looking to get to 
uh, you know, 10 to 15 percent share in our core markets, uh, five to 10 percent in our growth markets. You know, longer term, we're, we're looking to expand the range of, of core markets. And, that, and that's sort of that M&A plan at the, at the sort of low capital level, like, like the Africa project uh, fits into that category to provide us with, with future uh, growth and, and core markets. Uh, so we're not looking at, at large scale M&A at the moment, as we, as, as you really discussed at the start, the priority is to reduce leverage down towards the, the three and a half percent, three and a half times target in, in 2025. Uh, longer term, you know, this is a consolidating industry. We do have the capabilities uh, to benefit from M&A. And I think we're, we're proving through the, the integration and the delivery of, of synergies that we have the, the capabilities and the capacity uh, to execute large scale M&A successfully. So, Nothing uh, in the short term, but longer term, I think it uh, it could be it could be part of the plan. That's great, thank you. Just turning to the next question, if I may, um, does AI have any impact on the business? Well, it does, as AI has an impact on on all businesses. But I would say that it will have a bigger impact in time to come. So it's not just about AI; it's about AGI. And, and that's about how you can operate a business better from the writing of software development or marketing materials, interaction with customers. So I think as we look to the future, we certainly will be one of those companies who will be looking in a very focused way at what we can do using not just AI and the machine learning tools that are available are there, but what else could be done with AGI. So I would say at this stage, it was probably limited, but in, in, uh, in the time to come, it will undoubtedly have a significant bearing on the entire sector. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I know you guys have touched on the African JV, but the question reads, what are the terms of the African JV and what does 888A own and what funding has been committed? Uh, so, so the current ownership is is nineteen point nine nine percent, or you know, a fraction below twenty percent. Um, we, we, you can see through the the accounts that the, the funding has been. Uh, a low to mid single digit million figure. Uh, we we do uh, have the option to uh, take a majority control and, and and ownership in time and 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 in time we have the the option as well to take full controls full ownership. Um, so we we wouldn't go into sort of details on the on the on the exact mechanics, uh, but we we would say that it's a a low uh, capex way route to grow uh, scale in, in, in new markets, uh, leveraging our assets and capabilities and brands uh, with, with partners. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I think we're at the final question, unless any more come, come in during your response. But um, question reads, can you give more color on issues in Germany? And if so, you know how much drag may that cause going forward? Yeah, so within Germany, there are new rules in place that, that uh, make a number of requirements. Uh, one of the most challenging one is that for, for gaming, there's a turnover tax of, of just over 5%. So for, for players who play slot machines or, or, or who, who are typically used to playing machines with a kind of 95, 96, 97% return to player, uh, that type of product is, is not possible when you're, when you're paying uh, five percent of every uh, of every uh, spin uh, in taxes. So, so the, the the slot machines that work in or that have to work in in Germany are more around the eighty eight to ninety percent uh, return to player, um, and which is fine if everyone is uh, playing by the same rules. But what we're seeing is that there's quite a big uh, black market in Germany where customers are, are choosing to play with operators who still have. Uh, the same slot machines at, at 95, 96, 97% RTP. So, uh, you know, not paying tax and 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 playing uh, and paying much higher uh, payouts. So there's there's a bit of a lopsided sort of competitive dynamic uh, going on at the moment in the market. Uh, looking forwards, you know, we do think that there'll be more control on that, and 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 the regulator and 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 uh, rules will be enforced to to ensure that you, you know only those operators like us with licenses who are paying taxes properly. Uh, are able to 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 operate and and as the market gets more normal, uh, you know we we'd expect to see our our brands and our products uh, cut through. So you know long term we see this as a as a very attractive market. The the drag that we've seen this year is 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 largely cycling through. Uh, so we wouldn't expect to see significant further drags. And you know on a month to month basis we're we're seeing an improvement and and progress in that market. 
Vaughan, thank you very much indeed. And that um, I believe uh, may be the final question uh, for today's meeting. Of course, if actually hold on, there is one more, forgive me. Um, there is a lot of margin ground to make up in the second half of 23 to hit guidance. Can you describe in more detail cost saving actions that will achieve this? Is there a risk that lower marketing spend and other cost saves will hurt revenue performance? Yeah, so uh, when, you, when, we, when you look at H1 and what we expect to deliver in the second half of the year, so you need to consider similar level of revenue, slightly better gross margin uh, because of uh, synergies that uh, we will achieve in the second half of the year. Uh, so this will bring us uh, a, a bit higher gross profit. Then we will have lower level of marketing spend. Uh, the marketing spend is coming from synergies in, in, in part and also because of the normally the second uh, part of the year has less marketing than the first half. And then we will have lower OPEX. The combination of all these will make the difference in terms of profitability between the first and the second half. Now, um, in terms of the marketing spend, so we are looking carefully into optimizing the marketing to the new uh, strategy on how we address uh, the market. And uh, of course, you know, we need to make uh, the right balance between our short-term uh, target and our long-term uh, uh, target uh, for the next year and for the growth that we want to achieve in the next years. Thank you, Yarif. Uh, a further question, if I may, can you provide an update on the regulator's investigation into the gaming license in the UK? Uh, certainly, we were notified um, uh, uh, a short while ago that we would um, we would be uh, under review under section 1161 uh, or 2 um, it, and it was in relation to uh, the review is to consider uh, our management the licensees management of risk to the licensing objective of uh, of preventing gambling from being a source of crime or disorder being associated with crime or disorder or being used to support crime it came in relation to some activities pertaining to some shareholders who brought into the company and uh, with whom we'd had some uh, discussions in which uh, we had closed off. The actual review itself is currently uh, in design and the Commission have not uh, put a particular timetable or series of requests at this stage, but it really does relate to uh, events that have taken place externally and our ability to manage that risk. Uh, as a result of it, we do anticipate when the events that I think this really uh, 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 is, is related to will, will play themselves out over a period. But there are no operating consequences for us in relation to this review. We are, we are not under any particular operating uh, investigation, and we won't be. And uh, I don't think there will be any uh, disruption or any particular consequence as a result of it. It really is about our... Our, our risk to that licensing objective. It is utterly, in my, uh, as far as I as I recall and, and to my understanding, this is a completely unique set of circumstances in which the Gambling Commission has issued a review and it pertains to a very particular set of circumstances and I think it should be seen in that context. So I don't think it will uh, have uh, anything uh, particularly difficult for us as an outcome because I think that we have uh, managed this risk uh, particularly uh, effectively. And um, I look forward to the Gambling Commission completing their review in due course and endorsing that. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I think that is uh, the final question of today's session. So thank you everybody for your engagement uh, this afternoon. Um, Lord Minnison, Yara Fawn, I know that investor feedback will be important to you and I'll shortly redirect those on the call to give you their thoughts and their expectations. But I wonder before doing so, if I may, Lord Minnison, just come back to you just for a few closing comments and then I'll ask investors for their feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just thanks again to everyone for their interest, uh, encouragement and support of 888 Holdings and for uh, being here today and also for your questions. We're committed to our plan towards 2025 and in a, uh, in a year of transition, we think we uh, are able to report good progress and, uh, and uh, the addition of PER gives us very strong confidence about how we will be able to take all of this forward. We look forward to updating you in due course of our continuing progress. And once again, thank you for being here this afternoon. 
Thank you very much indeed. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of 888 Holdings PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. I may wish you all a very pleasant afternoon.